we affirm contention one is the Sahel. Seligman 20 writes that this year, the threat of growing terrorist activity in the Sahel is more urgent than ever. Violent extremist attacks in the region have skyrocketed in the last 18 months. The Sahel law saw the most rapid increase of such events in any region in 2019. But even as terrorist activity explodes in the Sahel, the US is withdrawing troops across the continent. Tensions with Iran have put unforeseen strain on US military resources in the Sahel due to increased demand in the Middle East. Selling it furthers that as violent activity increases, the Sahel must, may become the next major front for the global war on terror. As the Islamic State struggles for relevance in the Middle East, particularly after the killing of its leader, the group has increasingly leaned on its African affiliates for new recruits. Withdrawing U.S. troops in the Middle East allows for better counter-terror efforts in the Sahel, which is key as Corbett 19 quantifies that terror has killed over 800,000 people and the numbers continue to accelerate. Contention 2 is Iraq. Kadro 20 writes that in Iraq, military bases housing U.S. troops have been attacked over 10 times in the last six months by Iraqi Shiite militias. Cooper 20 explains that these militia groups want to provoke the U.S. into a conflict that would prompt Iraq to evict the remaining U.S. troops there. Unfortunately, conflict is set to escalate, as Mazzetti 20 reports just three weeks ago that the Pentagon has planned for an escalation of American combat in Iraq to destroy these militia groups. Hassan 20 adds, that Trump and top officials, including the Secretary of State and National Security Advisor, have been pushing for aggressive new action against these militia groups and see an opportunity to try and destroy them as in Iraq as leaders are distracted by the pandemic crisis in their country. Luckily, affirming solves, as Kent 20 finds that withdrawing U.S. troops is the best way to prevent conflict in Iraq, a conflict that Davies 18 quantifies would kill 2.4 million people. Contention 3 is Iran. Jones 11 explains that surrounding Iran militarily and putting it under constant threat of American military action has strengthened hardliners within Iran's regime and convinced them that the best path to self-preservation and Iranian security is through defiance and militarism. This defiance and militarism has come in the form of proxy attacks in Iraq. Kadro 20 writes that Iran currently relies on proxies to carry out its agenda of targeting U.S. interests in the Middle East. For example, Rogan 20 writes that on March 11th, under direction from Iran, Iraqi militia struck two U.S. bases, killing multiple U.S. soldiers and wounding others, prompting a U.S. retaliatory strikes against these militias. Unfortunately, conflict is coming, as Barnes 20 reports that on April 1st, Trump indicated that if Iran-backed proxy groups in Iraq struck again, rather than limiting retaliation to Iraq, the U.S. would go up the food chain and directly attack Iranian forces. Ward 20 furthers, that due to the lack of both communication and trust between the two nations, the situation would easily spiral out of control through a series of attacks and counterattacks, as Stark 20 finds that a hardliner in the Iranian regime favor escalation. Affirming solves, as GG20 concludes, that withdrawal of U.S. troops in the region would de-escalate tensions with Iran. Naidu 19 furthers, that should the U.S. leave the Persian Gulf, Iran would seek security in the region and extend the hand of friendship and brotherhood to other Persian Gulf nations. The impact is preventing conflict. Scott 19 quantifies that a U.S.-Iran war would kill 10 million people. Eurotropics 20 adds that this war would draw in other countries and trigger a long and widening regional conflict. Even worse, Goldenberg 19 reports that in the event of a strike against the U.S., the Pentagon recommends going big in its response to overwhelm the enemy and destroy as much of its military capabilities as possible so as not to leave U.S. forces vulnerable to further attacks. Trump agrees, seeing a large-scale assault as the only way to prevent humiliation, which is why Mosher 20 reports that Trump would retaliate using a low yield nuclear strike, which Prince in 19 quantifies would kill 34.1 million people in Iraq. Thus, we affirm. Uh, can I see two cards from the Sahel first contention? Uh, the first is like the Iranian strain, like Iran is placing strain on like the forces. And then the second one is like Corbin, I think, which is like 800,000.
Uh, they're both sent. Uh, let me check my email. Uh, we just got it. We'll start time. That's 30 on us. All right. Everyone can hear me, right? Uh, I can't see the face cams, but I think y'all seem to be good. Okay. In that case, let's start time. Now, we negate, and contention one is risky spending. If the U.S. withdraws troops, you, the Arab states of the Persian Gulf will increase their military spending for two reasons, and the first is burden sharing. Flynn 15 of the University of Alabama writes that U.S. presence in the Gulf subsidizes most of the military costs for countries, decreasing the money that they spend on defense. The CSIS finds that this has caused the Arab states to underinvest in key components of their own militaries. If the U.S. were to pull out now, a disproportionate defense burden would be placed back onto the states. Thus, Flynn quantifies that every 10% decrease in U.S. military presence leads to a 5% increase in military spending from the host nation. The second is the security umbrella. According to Hoggerdahl 19 of Tufts University, the presence of the U.S. military provides the best security guarantee for the Arab states because attack on them would mean attack on the United States. Critically, the CSIS finds that the most powerful U.S. military presence deters serious conventional conflicts and potential threats. Smaller threats means that states don't need military spending, as Gauba, the EU ISS, quantifies that every 1% reduction in the perceived external threat reduces military spending by 3%. This deterrent effect also makes allies less likely to engage in conflict, knowing that they are protected by the U.S., which is why Jacobson of the Norwegian University finds that every tenfold decrease in U.S. military presence makes the country 22% more likely to attack other states preemptively. Heightened military spending leads to two impacts, and the first is welfare reduction. Galb explains that Arab states can't take on debt like the U.S., meaning that they have to choose between military spending and other programs. Unfortunately, he finds that social and economic spending are usually first on the chopping block. This is empirically true as the Siri of the Washington Examiner finds that in 2018, following heightened neighbor military spending, Iran increased its defense budget by 90% financed directly by slashing the social safety net to the poor. Thus, Kalim 14 of UNT quantifies that every 10% increase in military spending would result in a 9.8% increase in poverty. This is particularly devastating in the Persian Gulf where Carnegie 19 finds that 250 million people are on the brink of poverty. The second impact is triggering an arms race. Hoggernall 19 finds that a U.S. withdrawal from the region would spur a regional arms race of both conventional and nuclear weapons. This would be dangerous as Galb furthers that particularly in the Middle East, heightened military spending provokes enemies such as Iran to increase their military expenditures. Overall, Finley of the Journal of Peace Research quantifies that cross-border increases in military spending increase the risk of violent conflict three times. Critically, Hoggerdahl concludes that the U.S. military is the best insurance policy in the case of any confrontation. Preventing escalation is key as Fisher 16 states that a war in the Middle East could kill upwards of 5 million. Contention, too, is an ISIS resurgence. A U.S. pullout would pave the way for an ISIS revival, which would devastate millions. As Peterson 20 of the CS Monitor explains that U.S. military presence has been the key reason why the coalition of Western nations fought back against ISIS, rebuilding and retraining Iraqi forces. This has severely curbed ISIS, as Business Insider in 19 finds that ISIS's territory has been reduced by 98% since 2015. However, Peterson finds that forcing U.S. troops out of areas like Iraq would pave the way for the resurgence of ISIS by eliminating the anti-terror coalition and demolishing training efforts. 
Pesha 20 of foreign policy purpose that the U.S. military is the sole provider of essential arms and training for the anti-ISIS troops, without which containing ISIS is impossible. This is empirically true, as Kiel 20 of the Hill finds that the U.S. withdrawal in Syria allowed ISIS to increase its number of attacks by 20%. This could put millions at risk, as NOAC 20 of the Washington Post quantifies that the previous ISIS rule displaced 1.8 million people and that 6 million people are currently as risk from uh, terrorism. I see the first card in your case that um, U.S. spending subsidizes Middle Eastern spending. Yeah. All right, I've just sent it. We'll, we'll start prep when we get it. Okay. Uh, the bottom one is the more the warrant. The top one is the quantification. Okay, I just got it. I'll start prep. All right, that was 30 seconds. You ready for a cross? Uh, yeah, give me a sec. Uh, just drink a water and then I'm good. Okay. I'm ready whenever you are. Okay. Uh, so in the status quo, is welfare spending going up or down in uh, Gulf states? Uh, I'm not sure. Do you have the answer? I, I don't. I, I was asking you. Yeah, well, uh, I don't actually know. <laughs> If you're if you're arguing uh, can, that like if your argument is that military spending like allows them to spend more on the welfare like what's the uniqueness for this argument don't you have to prove that like right now they are spending on welfare well we'd say like right now they have like well like we can show you that they have welfare programs we're just saying that in your world they will substantially okay. increase their military spending which directly how big are these welfare off. programs right now I mean right now that I mean I also like. I, like we just tell you that the welfare programs get cut like when like okay as military spending also increases can i ask you a question yeah okay so you read me the seligman evidence about the sahel right and it's yeah. like you you say like the iranian strain is like making it so that our troops have to get pulled out of the sahel or something right like, that, like yeah. that right so when we read the seligman evidence what is Selgman like? Where does Selgman say that the troops are actually going? What? I'm to the to like the Persian Gulf. That's not true because Selgman says that the troops are actually going to Russia and China. 
I, I, I'm pretty sure it says about the Persian Gulf because it talks about the Iranian strain. But either way, as long as we can prove that like reducing it in the Middle East allows for more counter-terror efforts in East Africa, like it doesn't matter. Like even if, wait, if, wait, 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 wait. if they're going down in the Middle East, that increases it in the Eastern Africa, which still allows us to get sovereignty. Can wait, I no, because like what, what Seligman says is like, because you guys say that the troops are like being pulled out of Africa to go and like fight Iran. So like we can yeah. like solve that, right? But no, Seligman actually says that they're pulling out the troops in Africa to go fight China and Russia in their respective territories. Yeah, it, so, so, so it says a potential future conflict with China and Russia and that they're being placed in the Middle East for that conflict, like in, in like places like Saudi Arabia. Like if you keep reading, it talks about that. Are, uh, are you like, sure? Because okay. like, yeah. it's like, I like, have- okay, no, matter, even, no matter what that, no matter what, like you, you like where they're being placed, it doesn't matter. Because as long as we reduce it in the Middle East, that give, frees up troops to go to Eastern Africa, no matter what. Like, no, because our argument is that like, even if you, our argument is that even if you free up troops in the Persian Gulf, they're not going to send them to Africa. They're going to what? send them to like. Russia okay, you can make that argument in rebuttal. Can I have a question? Yeah. You say that arms race increases the risk of conflict. Why? Oh, because we say that when both sides are building up arms, it makes them very tense because they don't know what the other one is doing. Why so it's your same. Wouldn't that kind of like your like to start a conflict because they don't want to like get nuked by the other side? Well, they're scared of preemptive strikes. I mean, you guys run a miscalc scenario on your second contention. I think our, it's second contention. Our miscalc scenario or is third. not a miscalc scenario. It's that the Pentagon is going to invade. That's not miscalculation. Wait, so the, the Pentagon like already is planning on invading, right? That's what yeah, you say? that is our evidence. Okay. Sure. Uh, we'll run a bit of prep. Where is the third judge? <clears throat> okay, that was 25 seconds. I think we have a problem if we don't have a third judge. Oh, oh wait, what? He, he was just here. I think he just left before cross. Left before cross? Well, yeah, that's when the notification popped up. So we're just going to like wait for the third judge, right? Yes. I think we should communicate with Tab that we have lost that person. Yeah. Do y'all want me to do it? Uh, yeah, could you? Or I could. Yeah, I, I, I can do it. Okay, cool. What room is this? 102.
I emailed PF help and I also emailed the judge directly. Um, on the email chain, the missing judge said that he got disconnected and needs uh, this room to be unlocked or something like that. The other judge is the host, so you would have to do it. I don't even know if... I have, Wait, no, I have, I have no idea how. Yeah, whenever I try to invite him to the meeting, it says that it's locked by the host. All right, I've unlocked it. Oh, it's tab room in the room. And then tab room is co host right now. Yeah, tab room is. Hey, I heard, that a, I heard that a judge dropped out. Yes. Um, I oh, think we're just going to try to wait. All right. Okay. I'm back now. There we go. Where, where did you get, where did you drop out? Tail end of first cross. I think that we have to redo the end of first cross, correct? Um, I guess we could. So is that like the last minute or so? Yeah, roughly like the last minute, last 45 seconds. Okay. Okay. I'm good whenever you are, Ronick. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, I think it was your question, I think. OK, I'll just take it. OK, okay so on Sorry your wrong scenario, oh. What? I said, sorry for the inconvenience. Continue. Oh, oh no problem, no problem. Oh, OK, um, sorry. All right, you ready, Ronick? Yeah. OK. So on the Iran war scenario, can you explain this a little bit? So is it like the US invading or is it like the US escalates and then there's some sort of miscalc between the two powers? On, on Iran specifically, it's that yes. um, Trump wants to overwhelm Iran, Iran in order to make sure that they no longer attack the US. So he uses a nuke to like hit the Iranian Wait, military. So, so Trump is scared of Iran attacking the US? Correct, yeah. Okay, you can have a question. Not like, like not like the U.S. mainland, but U.S. bases in the Middle East. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's talk about. Oh, I guess it's like. Um, let's talk about the ISIS resurgence argument. Why is the U.S. the only one who can stop ISIS? Because we've been diverting the most resources, and the Pesha evidence says that we are the main arms supplier to all the anti-ISIS coalitions. Why do arms end in an affirmative world? Oh, we can give you evidence that says that arms sales are part of military presence. Why? What? Why? I mean, are we'll go a little bit over, but like the logical way that I would explain why arms sales are a part of our military presence is because if we're selling arms to different Gulf states, then we do have influence over them. And they know that like, if people know that the U.S. is selling people arms, they're like, hey, the U.S. is like helping out these countries, which I would say is like a form of military presence. Wait, so are you saying arms sales go down in your world really quickly? In my world? Yeah. 
no because we keep military presence oh in, in my world sorry arms sales go down in my world like u.s arms sales to the gulf states got it okay um is everybody ready all right uh what's the order just your case okay okay on their first contention about risky spending, the first argument they talk about is burden sharing. They say that the U.S. subsidizes the cost of defense. Two responses. First, we can still give them things like money to subsidize the cost of defense. But second and more importantly, if we win any of our arguments, we link into this argument because they themselves say that if there's more conflict and more threats of conflict, then they start spending more on the military. So if we win any of our arguments about conflict happening in the region, that also links into this first argument. Their second argument is about how the U.S. provides a security umbrella. First, Ehrlichson, uh, Ehrlichson 20 explains that the U.S. Is the, is a, in the Gulf is a barrier, preventing an alternative collective security arrangement. Luckily, voting AF would allow for China, India, Japan, and others to fill in, sparking a mass diversification of security agreements that would solve back for this argument. This matters for two reasons. A, first, it stabilizes the region. As Ehrlichson furthers, these replacements would not pick sides in regional conflicts the way the U.S. has, and instead work towards regional cooperation by bridging divides between separate actors. But B, it's comparatively better than a world in which the U.S. stabilizes the region. Barry 20 explains that since the shale revolution, the U.S. is no longer reliant on Middle Eastern crude oil, with domestic oil production accounting for 60% of total oil consumption and more imports of crude oil from Canada than Saudi Arabia. Consequently, Barry continues that the U.S. no longer values regional stability, adopting escalatory measures in the Middle East, and acting as a force for instability, as we've seen recently. Conversely, China and Japan are largely dependent on Middle Eastern crude oil, meaning they have an inherent incentive to ensure, uh, ensure stability in the region, unlike the U.S., making them a better actor for this security umbrella. But second, Satloff 19 explains that U.S. presence leads our allies to act aggressively knowing they have U.S. protection. Ashford 18 explains that as a result, U.S. allies have never felt the need to create regional alliances for security reasons. Long 19 writes that affirming would create these regional pacts and allow for collective response to threats, reinstating regional deterrence. Kamak 19 concludes that the Gulf will stay internally stable, unstable in the status quo. However, alliance of uh, creation in the uh, affirmative world would prevent further escalation towards regional conflict. But third, Garal 20, which probably postdates their evidence, finds that our allies have lost faith in the U.S.'s security umbrella because of our unwillingness to respond to the attacks on oil facilities with force, meaning that we should already be seeing their impacts happening. Rather, we see the opposite. Jones 11 finds that our circlement of Iran only empowers hardliners, whom Elective 15 finds are the one that push for regional expansion and cause the threats that they talk about. Conversely, Abda 19 says that removing troops will allow for moderates to take over, which Reinkoff 19 says is the only long-term solution to Iranian aggression. On this impact on welfare spending, first, there's no context as to how good spending is right now in their world. But second, it's not unique. They're losing most of their revenue right now because of oil prices, so cuts to social spending will already happen. But third, they can... Uh Sorry, but then on this argument about proliferation. First, even without true presence, the existence of the security agreements between the U.S. and Middle Eastern countries gives these countries a sense of security. Also, the argument about other actors coming in the region and regional alliances create, being created also prevents this type of proliferation from happening. But third and finally, there's literally no warrant read in their case as to why proliferation increases the chance of conflict. At the point where there's no warrant read, don't let them articulate a new one in their second rebuttal. They cannot go for this proliferation argument. There's no warrant here. On their second contention about an ISIS resurgence, five responses. First, other actors will conduct counter-terror operations if the U.S. leaves. A, the New York Post 19 writes that Russia and Turkey have literally reached an agreement that they would deploy their forces in the Gulf to fill the void after Trump withdraws. B, Gladstone 19 writes that the U.N. engages in counter-terror operations. But C, we read two arguments about how other countries would fill the void like Japan, India, and China. They would also engage in these types of operations, especially considering my opponents don't read a reason why only the U.S. can do these things. They just read good things the U.S. does. We'd say that these good things can be done by other actors. Second, we can continue to fight terror in numerous other ways, for example, with UAVs or OCOs. But third, arms sales literally continue either way. That's not a form of presence. For example, if I go to like Safeway and the guy sells me bread, it's not like that guy has a presence in my house anymore. Arms sales are not presence. But fifth, you turn it. Pape 10 reports that in the Middle East, US presence increases suicide bombings because radicals attempt to weaken any outsider presence. Thus, we affirm. All right. All right, we'll just run like a stack of crap and then um, we'll let y'all know we're getting coming.
the Alex killing um, Oh, you on the camera? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so hi. Can everyone hear me? Okay, so. How much prep was so, that? How much prep was that? We used like a minute and a half right there. Yeah. So I, I don't know how much is left, but I'll let Alex run the calculations for that. Yeah, yeah, one minute left. Okay, a minute left. Cool. Um, so the order I'm going to do things in is just like our, uh, just like frontlining our case and down their case. So I'll just get a sip of water and I'll start. Okay, so I'll start time now on risky spending they first off come up here and say that we can still give them things like money we would contend that arms are completely and totally irreplaceable our csis evidence is really explicit in saying that like uh arab states have like completely and totally underinvested in really key parts to our military the money doesn't necessarily totally compensate for the arms that they're missing that only the us is capable of providing they also come up here and say that like if uh they win their arguments then uh they win like this contention i'll get to their arguments later they come up here and say that like other countries can fill in i would contend that first this fill in is completely and totally non-contextualized you have zero guarantee that they can completely and totally substitute u.s presence so don't let them get away with this blippy response they also come up here and say that these actors would not take sides but i would contend that every single one of the actors that they talk about like china japan and india would definitely take sides they all have vested re uh, vested interests in the Persian Gulf in the Middle East. They also come um they also come up here and say that like the US is gonna like block out probability of like negotiations. First off, I would contend that like our Bayumi evidence says that US leverage allows us to push negotiations empirically this serves true because when the US leverages pull outs we can actually like cause negotiations. Next memory also says that in the long term while the US presence serves as a deterrent all sides in the Middle East and in the Persian Gulf will realize that like negotiations are the only way to sustainably have like peace. Um, next off, they also come up and say that like there's no faith in like the U.S. umbrella anymore. We would contend that like the U.S. not showing force as of re uh, recently didn't necessarily mean that any of these countries like lost their umbrella entirely. And it, the way that this is proven is the fact that like they didn't make massive reroutes of uh, and escalate their military spending. They also come up here and say that like we lose this contention. Um, because of like the oil shock going on right now, I would contend that in the long term, after the oil shock fizzles out, we still get grounds on this contention. They also say we don't provide a warrant for proliferation leading to war. I would contend that we just say that more exchanges because countries will like ramp up their militaries will just lead to more risk of conflict. And additionally, we tell you it leads to a higher risk of preemptive strikes. Going on to our contention too. They read fill in again. Again, you have no guarantee of a total fill in. It's completely and totally a blippy response. But that being said, our keel evidence even accounts for this and says that when the US pulled out of Syria and actors like Russia and Turkey filled in, ISIS attacks still went up 20%. Next, they come up here and say that we can like just provide them with other things. Reference our Zenko evidence, like UAVs and like OCOs constitute military presence because they bring up the Safeway analogy. It literally makes no sense. Like the US still has influence over these nations by providing UAVs and OCOs. And then they say that like terror goes up, but we would contend that if you reference the Torvath evidence in our case, we say that ISIS's territory has gone down 98%. So 98% less people are feeling the impact of ISIS. Um, and additionally, Romero says that terror is down like 50% holistically. Next, let's go on to their contentions. They read Sahel. So first off, they have zero evidence saying that a U.S. pullout in the Middle East leads to troops going into the Sahel. We contend they get zero solvency for the Sahel crisis. The argument also assumes that the U.S. won't expand its budget to fight terror in the Sahel. Additionally, Kristen 19 finds the Secretary of Defense wouldn't even redeploy troops to the Sahel, rather he just placed them somewhere out like China. And this is literally right out of their own Seligman author too, who says that the troop brings a trade-off between the Sahel and China and Russia. Next on Iraq, the RAND Corporation conducts the most holistic study on the topic of U.S. troops and the incidents of conflict. It concludes that after 56 years, the probability of interstate war is as low as 0.1% because U.S. troops serve as a deterrent towards other countries attacking. That's why New York University in 2019 finds that the only chance of that the chance of interstate war in the Persian Gulf is the lowest it has been in 50 years. And um, their only risk of larger conflict is when like all the Arab states start ramping up military spending and escalating. On Iran, Memory wrote in March of 2020 that the the U.S. did not pursue offensive military force in, uh, against Iran prior to 2019, causing Iran to escalate and create more military threats. However, after our killing of Soleimani, 
we prove that like Iranian provocation will have devastating consequences, which my memory furthers that in the long term, Iran will be coerced into diplomatic talks. Uh, next, and on like, and Rogan finds that like, uh, that the only reason that Saudi Arabia moved into like ceasefire agreements in Yemen was because the US was able to use our power to like leverage them. And finally, like on war with Iran, um, the uh, Grizzale 25 that the United States and the Senate uh, passed a war power resolution to limit like Trump from invading Iran. So they can't even like outline the Trump launch strike. Uh, everything after Rogan was over time. Can we strike that? Are all the judges counting this stuff over time? I have, wait, I'm clocking in at 4.03. Okay, it's fine. I'll respond to that. Yeah, we're running. It's fine. Yeah. Okay, you ready for cross? Yeah, I'm done. Okay. So you read this RAND Corporation study saying that the probability of interstate war, what's that? Mm -hmm. Echo. Uh, anyways, is 0.4%. The, the line? Uh, the line? Sorry, you, you cut out there for a second. Oh, uh, hold on. Uh, hold on. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Wait, Ronnie, can you mute your Wait, phone call? Can you mute your phone call? I'm muted. I think it's on there. I think it's on there. Wait, can y'all not hear me? Well, it's your laptops. It's like echo. Like everything I say it says it back to me. Maybe my volume just stopped really high. Is this better? Um, Did you say something? Yeah, yeah, it is better. Okay. No, it. Okay, yeah. Hold up. I I, I have had one second in now. Okay. Wait, or they could just use the same laptop. That one. Huh? That one. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Don't worry about it. Okay. Hi, is this better? Yeah, it is, I think. Yeah, 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 it is much better. Okay. Okay, cool, cool. Ready for cross? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So the RAND study says that without troops, the probability is 0.4% of interstate conflict. With 0. troops, what is 0.1% without troops? Oh, wait, without troops, my bad, yeah. Like, with troops, he says that the probability of war is as little as, like, 0.1%. But he gives a range. He doesn't say it's 0.1%. What does he say the range is? I don't know. Someone tell me? Yeah, 0.1 to 0.6%. So how do we know that you have any solvency if your own study doesn't conclusively conclude that it increased the probability of conflict? I would contend that it's, like, still less than 1%. That is, like, That's incredibly, not incredibly... That again, so your study says that it could be anywhere from 0.1 to 0.6%. So, yes. assuming why, but that means that it's not conclusively a decrease to 0.4% or an increase to 0.4%. For all we know, it could be a decrease in the chance of conflict according to your own study, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Wait, 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 hold on. Your audio cut like a little bit out right there, but I think I understood the context of what you were saying. But like we would contend that like the only point of random evidence was to prove that the probability of interstate conflict is just incredibly, incredibly low. Wait, but is it for time. anyone else, or is that just me? Wait. Okay, I couldn't hear that. Yeah, I, hear that. I think the speaker on your mic might be a bit. Like, okay. I mean, yeah, it looks like. I can't understand what you're saying. It's like lagging. We can't hear anything you're saying. Yeah. Wait, could you just... You're sitting in the same room as Alex, right? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go over... Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, cool. I'll go over there. I'll go over there. Okay. Hello? Yeah. Okay, are, are we my better? computer is working fine. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So for cost, we'll just... Okay, yeah, we're at like 1.30. We'll just continue time. So what was your answer to the question about how it doesn't conclusively say that the probability goes up? Okay, yeah, yeah. So the RAND evidence was just pretty much to say that like probability of like conflict in like the Persian Gulf is just extremely low. Well, it's taking inter it says interstate, but that's, that's not exactly answering my question. While I understand that's what you're saying, my question is more... Okay. So uh, you know what, we can just move on. You can just take a question. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. So I wanted to take a question on like, I want to go back to like what they were talking about in First Cross about the Sahel. Like what guarantee do you have that a pullout of troops from the Middle East directly diverts them into the Sahel? Because they want more troops in the Sahel. So if they have the chance to, they'll put them there. Can I but, take a question? Wait, wait, wait. I, I want to follow up on this. So like, Could you follow up when we take, huh? Okay. You can just take a okay, second. Yeah. 
Okay, so like, but just the fact of the matter is like, your own Seligman evidence says that it's mostly to counter like China and Russia. So why wouldn't we just like put troops yeah, the, directly there? The Seligman evidence like is pretty specific in saying that it trades off with the Middle East. And like second, like yeah, yeah. again, our warrant is pretty simple. They want more in the middle. Uh, they want more in the Sahel. So if there's more available to put in there. Can I take a question though? Yeah, of course. So if an argument does not have a warrant, we should not evaluate it, right? Um, uh, what are you referring to on our case that is unwarranted? I mean, I'm just asking a general question for how the debate... I mean, yeah, but I don't think okay. there's anything we didn't warrant adequately. Yeah, that's fine. And we disagree with that, which I'll ask my question. You can take a question, though. It crosses basically up. I've clocked yeah. in at like a minute and a half. So. Um, can I see the... Can I see the Kiel evidence that attacks increased by 20% in Syria? Yep. Alex, wait, wait. Uh, where do I click on the original? Okay, this one. Yeah, just hit reply all from that. Wait, what? Where? Wait. Uh, I don't have a reply all button. Like it literally just disappeared. Wait, yeah. I'm so confused. It says I can only reply to the judge Nate Day. If you go like, go up in the email and like try to reply to the first wait, message, yeah. it might give you a reply. Okay. Like, Oh, okay, okay. I had to click on like the tiny, the tiny stuff. All right, I'm sending it now. Veronica, did you get it yet? Because, okay, yeah, I mean, it... okay, I just got the card. We'll start prep. Oh, and just so you know, I didn't highlight the turkey thing, but it's at that's the last sentence. Okay. All right, I'm going to start on our argument about uh, our case and then go back to their case. Is anybody not ready? Okay. On our second contention about Iraq. We read the Cooper evidence that Iraqi militias are attacking U.S. bases and the Hassan evidence that the Pentagon is now planning an invasion to destroy those Iraqi militias. They read uh, cards about chances of interstate conflict. That is not responsive at all. Our scenario is that the U.S. right now is going to invade. That is not an interstate conflict. But moreover, their card talks about U.S. presence. Our specific scenario is that the U.S. presence is what is causing this conflict. That's really important because the Kent evidence says that withdrawing is the only way to de-escalate tensions. And the Davies evidence says that this conflict is going to kill 2.4 million people in Iraq. Here's the weighing. The weighing is very clear because their argument about like social spending is not contextualized at all. You don't know where this conflict is going to happen, how much social spending goes down. And on the ISIS scenario, their impact card about how ISIS attacks increased by 20% is a claim from the ISIS website. They have no contextualized impact. Our impact about 2.4 million people dying in Iraq is the best impact in this round and it's definitely where you should be voting.
With that, very quickly on our third contention about Iran, they really turn over time about Yemen. But we'd say that there's not, I mean, this is not empirically true because uh, Brown finds that this year, after the US threatened to pull out, they actually went to the negotiating table. But moreover, this is just a cross application of their case, which means I can respond to their case and take it out. With that, let's go to their case. There are the, the very key thing that they clean drop in their rebuttal that will end the round is the regionalism of turn. Sahawas explains that U.S. presence leads their allies to act aggressively, knowing they have U.S. protection. But Ashford explains that uh, the long evidence explains that a firm would create regional packs that allow for collective responses to the threats, which have which creates regional deterrence. Their only evidence that they respond to talks about negotiations. A negotiations is not our argument. Our argument is about alliances. But more importantly, these negotiations never work for the exact uh, warrant that the Satloff evidence gives that the allies feel emboldened. This takes them out of all their arguments because A it means that they no longer have to increase spending because there's a regional deterrent, they don't need the United States anymore, but B, more importantly, it takes them out of their argument about ISIS resurgence because there's a collective deter a collective response to things like ISIS, which prevents any ISIS resurgence from happening. But moreover, this also outweighs this argument because even if they have some short-term impact to conflict, we, in the long term, create stability in the Middle East, uh, Middle East through these alliances, which then takes out, uh, decreases the chance of any conflict, which on the long term is going to outweigh their argument as a whole. Again, there is no response to this in rebuttal. Don't let them respond to it in summary. With that, let's also talk, talk about fill-in. We read the early evidence that talks about how other countries would fill in, like China, Russia, and Japan. They see that, no, it, that our argument is non-contextualized. It is very contextualized. They would increase their military spending and they would sign security agreements. They also say that every actor is going to give sides. We read reasons why they wouldn't because they care about Middle East stability for oil, whereas the United States doesn't. This is very important because it also takes them out of their argument because they, they have an umbrella from another country. They don't need the United States. And it also takes out the ISIS resurgence argument because other countries like Russia and Phil are, or, uh, to Russia and Turkey are already there. Again, their 20% impact card is from a is from the ISIS website. It is not a good impact scenario. Should definitely be voting on Iraq or the drop regionalism turn. We're gonna start prep. Oh wait, unmute. Okay. All right, we've got 10 left on the clock. All right, is everyone ready? Okay. So the order for this speech will be, let's go first on their case, then on our case. All right. I was starting on their contention too, by the way. All right, let's start time. Now, the first key response to extend on their case is the RAND Corporation evidence that tells you that the probability of interstate war is at 0.1% with US troops. He says that all of their scenarios about war are not talking about interstate conflicts. But if you literally just look up the definition of what interstate means, it is just a war between two states. This is exactly what their impact scenario is. This is just terminal defense on the probability of their argument. But then you can cross apply our arms race argument when I get onto it. Then he says that US's, US presence is causing all of this conflict. I'll also frontline this here. But then on their contention three on Iraq, what the memory to evidence tells you from a rebuttal is that right now the US's military pressure on Iran is forcing them onto the negotiating table because the Iranian hardliners know that they're not gonna last with US presence in the region because they can't do anything because they don't have the credible threat to actually take out the power. And that's why they're gonna go to the negotiating table because they see negotiations with the US and all the other powers as their only way out in the future. But then they drop the war powers response that Sarah Bash makes at the end of his rebuttal. Senate, the Senate literally already passed 
a resolution saying that Trump cannot strike Iranian like forces in the Middle East because of the Soleimani attack. This is already passed through the Senate. They don't respond to this. This is just terminal defense on their case. But then let's go into our first contention about risky spending. They make a really big deal about this U U.S. barrier stopping collective security between China and India and all these other powers. But first of all, you can extend the Hoggardall evidence from our case that says that specifically the U.S. umbrella is so key because without the U.S. umbrella, these Arab states' militaries are so critically underdeveloped that even with other states, they still probably wouldn't feel comfortable with their own security because they don't care if negotiations happen, if their entire military is just crumbling because the CSI evidence tells you that the key components of their military are calm. They extend the Flynn evidence that tells you that every 10% decrease in U.S. military presence increases the uh, military burden and like military spending by 5%. And we're really going for both impacts. The first is on welfare. We tell you from Basiri that historically, the Arab states always trade off their welfare with their military spending. And Kalim tells you that there is a almost one-to-one -one ratio. And this is important because Carnegie tells you that there are currently 250 million people on the brink of of poverty in the uh, Persian Gulf. That's important. And then go into the second link or go into the second impact on the arms race. We tell you that when these uh, Arab states are increasing the amount of military spending, that they're going to increase the likelihood of conflict because when other states see each other militarizing, they are more likely to launch a preemptive strike. That's the Finley evidence. But then they make like, let's go back on the security guarantee. They basically just say that we don't give a lot of good responses. But first of all, extend the Bayoumi response from rebuttal that tells you that the U.S. is already pushing these countries into molding multilateral negotiations and then the Rogan evidence that tells you that we're also pushing them with our leverage into even more negotiations. Finally on the ISIS contention, this is very easy to weigh on because they just only extend that Russia and Turkey are going to fill in but the Kiel evidence is very good. They just say it's an ISIS report but the defense agency literally says it's also really credible. Um, can I take the first question? Uh, yeah. So if you don't extend a link to an argument, should you, should the argument be evaluated? Um, like. Just a like general question. Um, yeah, probably. If there's no link to the argument, it should be evaluated? No, 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 no. like it probably shouldn't be evaluated. Are you talking about like ISIS? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. yeah, we probably won't go for ISIS. That's fine. Okay, when you say probably, you mean you won't? Because like. Yeah, because I didn't even extend an impact. We're not going to go for it. Okay, you're not going for ISIS. All right. You, okay, cool. No, that's, yeah, yeah. 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 You think oh, I didn't even start. I didn't take start the time. But, um, we're at 35 seconds, don't worry. Okay, let's yeah. talk about your, like, conflict scenarios, right? Yeah. So both of your yeah. conflict scenarios are dependent on, like, the U.S. attacking, right? One. Yeah. We, we only go for Iraq. We don't go for Iraq. Wait. But you're only... Okay, yeah. so... So, like, if the Congress already says that Trump isn't allowed to strike Iranian forces, yeah, then which is why we're going for Iraq because that's not Iranian forces. Can I take a question? You say, but you say that we're going to attack Iranian forces inside Iraq. No, right? we're attacking no, Iraki. 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 Can I take a question? We're attacking Iraqi militias. Yeah. Okay. The sign up is that they already planned it. Like, okay, yeah. Like, I have a question. Wait, so, I take a question. I did. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um. So the impact of your first contention that you're going for is just welfare, right? No, we um, also extend the arms race impact. We just we also say that like states are more likely to launch preemptive strikes. Oh, oh, oh! So that's the extension. You're not extending any yeah. like um, you're just we like that they're gonna launch a strike. We, huh? What? No, like no, like terminalization. Just that they're gonna launch a strike. Okay, I, I, I didn't so, know it. Okay, so the way we're gonna go for it is like we extended the Finley evidence, which says we pretty much triple the risk of war, and uh, when like you have the, when you have an arms race scenario going on, so it's basically just gonna be like taking account like it's just tripling all of your impacts like we're just going to use it that way what like, we'll probably try and link into the wait, iraq wait, scenario wait, don't you well, say the probability, the the probability of interstate uh, conflict with uh, without u.s troops present is 0 0.4 percent what yeah Isn't we, argument okay. that the probability of interstate conflict without u.s presence is 0 0.4 percent without the wait without yeah, yeah without without the, point four percent. Percent. So the that way that you your own argument yeah, okay, so our point, wait, wait, how does this take out our own argument? So your argument is that when we pull troops, these countries are going to have preemptive strikes. Let's move past the problem that there's no warrant on the argument. You take out your own argument by saying even without troops, the probability is only 0.4%. So these preemptive strikes, the only probability is 0.4%. Wait, okay, wait, we're not even, hold up. Hold up, wait, okay. if you're running the Iraq contention, then isn't your Iraq probability 0.4%? So wait, the only not... way you get offense off of this is by like, conceding 
that like no, so, no, no you know, Iran mean, argument think... is a U.S. invasion. If we're a the U.S. invasion and b reading a general stat isn't going to take out the fact that the U.S. has literally already planned the invasion. Yeah, Pentagon exactly. has already said like they're going to increase their aggression. Like that doesn't take it out. A general stat doesn't take that out. Okay, that's time. Uh, Ronic, how much prep do we have left? We have a minute left. Okay, we'll run it. Okay, is so everybody ready? Um, it'll start on our argument on Iraq, then weighing, then their first contention. Is anybody not ready? Okay. On Iraq, the Cooper evidence says that Iraqi militias are attacking U.S. bases in Iraq to get the U.S. to leave. And the Mazzetti and Hassan evidence indicate that the Pentagon, Trump, Pompeo, and the National Security Advisor have all planned as of two weeks ago to escalate conflict to war in Iraq. And the Kent 20 evidence says that the only way to avert this war is to vote at and withdraw these troops so that we don't see this happen. And the Davies evidence specifically quantifies that 2.4 million people would die. In rebuttal and summary, we get only one response to this contention, and it's this study from the Rand Corporation saying, quote, the probability of interstate war in the Middle East is 0.1%. First of all, they concede that if arguments don't have warrants, they shouldn't be evaluated. They don't read a warrant for why the probability of interstate war is so low. But second and most importantly, they don't interact with what Ronick explains. Our scenario is not a scenario between interstate war between two countries in the Middle East. It's a U.S. invasion of Iraq, which we tell you literally is going to happen. They can read as many hypothetical warrants that they want from like four years ago, but our evidence from two weeks ago trumps this, saying that they want to attack, proving that the probability is 100%. Their random generalized stat does not matter. At that point, we are clean winning our argument. Let's go to the wing. We, they drop the argument that we link in because if there is more conflict in the region, then these other countries will see that conflict and want to increase their own military spending. That's dropped. But second and most importantly, there is not a second of weighing in their summary. Do not let them read new weighing arguments in the second final focus that we don't have a chance to respond to. Our argument is so much more contextualized than theirs because first on their impact about welfare spending, they don't explain how much welfare spending is going to go down or how much it's going up in their world. It's not contextualized at all. But second and more importantly, on this argument about how these countries are going a preemptive strike. A, where are these countries going to preemptive strike? B, who is going to preemptive strike? But C, how many people are going to die in this preemptive strike? There's no context on their impacts. You always prefer our impacts. It's such a clean vote for us. But then back on their side of the flow anyways, they drop our argument about regionalism. We tell you from the satellite evidence that these countries feel no need for security agreements right now because they have the U.S., but the long evidence says that they would switch over to regional alliances, which give them that same security umbrella. They still feel supported. So even if they're underdeveloped, those regional alliances support them. What they have no offense. Again, this is dropped in second rebuttal. Don't let them respond in second final focus, even though I know they're going to try to. All right, we're going to run like our last 10 of prep. All right, that's time. Wait, are you using your computer or mine? I'll come over to yours, actually. OK. OK. Um, Alex, could you? Oh, yeah, timer. All right. So the order is going to be um, Iraq and then uh, just social spending. So that being said, everyone good? Okay. I'll start time. 
Now, the two most crucial responses that they don't touch in summary or focus come off of memory and Rogan, which pretty much say that the U.S.'s ability to like exercise leverage using its troops allow it to cause negotiations. Now, the reason this completely and totally takes out their Iraq scenario is because we would contend that the U.S.'s use of force allow for a peaceful facilitation instead of the war scenario that they talk about. But additionally, they respond to the Rand thing by saying that the U.S. is already planning the attack. The Rand evidence just goes to show that their entire Iraq scenario is inherently low probability. They say we didn't provide a warrant, but I can literally show you my rebuttal speech doc. I say that the reason it's low probability is because the U.S.'s troops serve as a deterrence, which just also goes to serve as like more backing for our memory and Rogan responses. Additionally, we can also link into their Iraq scenario using our Finley evidence, which says that like uh, arms sales, that, that arms races increases, increase the probability of preemptive strikes and like uh, and, and, and all out war by three times. And the reason is because countries get more uncertain. Again, they keep bashing our warranting, but Alex and I have been bringing up our warranting literally this entire round. The fact of the matter is they also lose the round off of a few things, they uh, off of our social spending contention, because they pretty much say that we don't contextualize anything in the contention. They miss out on three really key pieces of evidence. The first one is the Basiri evidence that Alex reads. What it pretty much says is that empirically, Iran uh, cut its spending by roughly 90%, that other Arab states are more likely to like, uh, and other Arab states are like to follow in this model. Our Flynn evidence also says that when this happens, like uh, there will increase, like for every, 10% increase in their military spend in their military spending poverty goes up roughly like 9% and our Carnegie evidence makes it really clear that there are 250 million people on the brink of poverty in the Middle East and in the Persian Gulf right now on scope we are winning this round right then and there because when we link into the 250 million people living in poverty we like cleanly outweigh on scope we're also linking into <clears throat> Are we all here and ready? Yes, I'm here. I'm here as well. Okay, who wants to announce? Okay, congratulations on breaking at the TOC. Um, it is a 3-0 decision for the pro. Who wants to start? Um, I, I suppose can also start. I can start off. Okay. Okay, you talk first. <laughs> it's all yours. Oh, okay. Um, I think the pro wins the regionalism argument. Um, the pro is able to solve the internal link to the poverty impact framing um, that the negative goes for. I think the negative needs a better and earlier response to this argument. Um, and I think that you can consider applying your arguments about weak military infrastructure at this place on the flow um, to kind of um, disrupt the ability to solve that internal link. Next person. Cool. Yeah, so there's really two places to vote in this round. There's the Iraq argument, the social spending one. I found that the pros arg about the US are even planned for operations in Iraq to be more compelling, mostly because it was warranted better and more consistently, specifically with the Kent and Davies cards. And I also found that the RAND evidence they had showing that the like low probability of conflict applying specifically to states in the Middle East to be persuasive. I would have liked to have seen a uh, more engagement about like the definition of interstate and have seen more play there, but that's just me. 
On the social spending arg, I do agree with the pros assessment that the con didn't really give adequate contextualization for the risky spending. I'm not coming away from this round really knowing which countries are increasing their spending, when exactly the spending is triggered, and also how we can be sure that the military spending increases, period. But to be fair, I also had flowed through the security guarantee args of the pro made, which was along the lines of other countries like China and Japan coming in and taking up the US's role, and therefore the US's spending. So that's why I voted the way I did. Yeah, I, I saw the round very similar um, or in a very similar fashion. Um, same thing with regard to Iraq. I think that like um, Khan's responses to the Iraq arguments are, are not uh, clear or consistent enough throughout the round. Also, like I don't think you do enough with regard to warranting that argument, um, the 0.1% argument. Um, uh, and the same thing, like I think that if anything that it seems like from the pro responses uh, to the con security umbrella argument, it seems like it's actually going to push uh, these countries to like cooperation, working together and, and actually increase st stability as opposed to like, you know, uh, ramping up military spending. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, yeah. Thank Thanks to, to all three judges and uh, good you. job, guys. Oh, also, just have a good round. Good luck against you. Again, Again congratulations the, on making it this far. I, I see the rounds being recorded. Is there any way to get that? Like, you know, does anyone know where to get that recording? I think it's on, I think the tab is recording. Yeah, yeah I think it's going to be archived somewhere. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, thank, thank you. you.